Three of the most important epiphanies humanity has had have come from the study of paleontology. The idea that species can go extinct became obvious soon after fossils began systematically being studied. Next, the idea that Earth's biosphere replenished itself with new species through a natural evolutionary process became apparent, bolstered by observable patterns in both the fossil record and the distribution of living species. Most recently, the idea that Earth's continents have traveled around the planet's surface via plate tectonics gained acceptance, and this was a debatable idea even until the latter half of the 20th century. And all of this is thanks to fossil discoveries. Since paleontology is such a young discipline, recounting its major milestones can still be done from the beginning fairly easily. We can start from a more biological perspective and then cover the geological perspective. Both facets are important and complementary to one another. To oversimplify the differences between the two perspectives, the biology of dinosaurs focuses on how dinosaurs lived, and the geology on how they died and were buried. And the quicker the better, because nothing increases one's chances of becoming a fossil like quick burial. So in 1677, uh, unbeknownst to the author at the time, the first illustration of a dinosaur bone was published. Robert Plott, the curator of the museum at Oxford College, described the specimen of what was probably part of a megalosaurus femur, and he described them as the remains of a massive elephant, perhaps one of the war elephants that Hannibal had used to conquer parts of southern Europe in 218 BCE. There were other interpretations published of the same specimen, but the specimen disappeared at some point and is lost to science, so we'll never be able to say for sure what it was. The first dinosaur bone recognized as belonging to an enormous extinct reptile was described by William Buckland in 1815. He published an illustration of a lower jaw, which was more than a foot long, containing sharp, serrated teeth, and he named the specimen Megalosaurus. A few years later, in 1822, another publication was produced describing the fossil remains of a dinosaur, and this was by Gideon Mantell, working with his wife, Mary Ann, and they discovered the remains of a plant-eating dinosaur with teeth resembling those of a modern iguana, just massively scaled up. Hence the name they assigned, Iguanodon, which means iguana tooth. Gideon began to obsess over fossils and let his medical practice and its income dwindle as he pursued his new interest. His devotion to paleontology led to the third known dinosaur in 1833, Hyliosaurus. The first scientist to unite these three fossil organisms and to coin the term dinosaur was Sir Richard Owen. He was the chief anatomist at the British Museum of Natural History. Owen was largely seen as the authority on fossil organisms in the English-speaking world, the British equivalent of the famous George Cuvier in France. He gave the dinosauria its name in 1842 and then directed the artist Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins in production of the first life-size dinosaur models for Crystal Palace Park in 1853. Together they worked to reproduce the three animals Owen had assigned to the dinosauria when he erected it. Megalosaurus, Iguanodon, and Hyliosaurus. A number of other statues were also made to represent other fossil organisms, but only these three were dinosaurs. In 1859, Charles Darwin's famous treatise on the origin of species was published, formalizing the theory of evolution, though the word evolution does not actually occur in earlier editions. Richard Owen did not buy into the idea and was one of the prominent scientists who opposed evolution. In North America, paleontology was just beginning to be studied here at that time. Evolutionary biology was a divisive topic between academic camps as well. The first dinosaur skeleton in North America was found in 1858 in a marl quarry near Haddonfield, New Jersey. Joseph Leidy, the most prominent vertebrate paleontologist in the U.S. at the time, described the specimen. His work attracted a talented young naturalist named Edward Drinker Cope to seek a position as Leidy's student assistant. While Cope was skeptical of evolutionary theory, he was one of the most diverse naturalists of his day, describing living and fossil organisms of all sorts. 
Cope racked up an immense number of publications during his lifetime, authoring more than 1,400 papers. His astounding body of work is honored today with a prominent journal of herpetology and ichthyology bearing his Latinized name, Copia. The most prominent supporter of evolutionary theory in North American paleontology was Othniel Charles Marsh. He and Cope began as friendly colleagues, even naming species after one another, but their relationship soured. They developed a rivalry with one another that was epically bitter and that drove each of them to spend their significant fortunes trying to outscience the other. Their famous fight is sometimes referred to as the Bone Wars or Great Dinosaur Rush. Cope and Mark rushed their works into print, publishing many mistakes and assigning different names to specimens that represented a single species. Each found ways to sidestep the peer review process, which is supposed to maintain the quality of the scientific body of knowledge by avoiding errors and duplicate work. Marsh used his political connections to gain control of the USGS, the U.S. Geologic Survey, and its federal publication mill. He also used his influence to prevent Cope from getting his papers published in most pertinent academic journals. To get his work back into circulation, Cope had to literally buy his own journal and publish his work there. With direct access to the presses, neither man felt they had the need or the time to have their manuscripts reviewed, hence the importance of peer review in the publication of scientific papers. To assist in amassing huge collections of fossils to describe, Cope and Marsh each hired field collectors and independent commercial paleontologists. Each of them hired the famous fossil hunter from western Kansas, Charles H. Sternberg, to guide them through the Cretaceous chalk beds in search for fossil fish and reptiles from the western interior seaway. Sternberg raised a family dynasty of fossil hunters, and their family is credited with a vast number of some of the most important fossil specimens ever found. Two of Marsh's most important field men were also Kansans. One was Benjamin Franklin Mudge, who started the Kansas Geologic Survey and was a professor at Kansas Agricultural College, now K-State. That is, until he got fired for teaching evolutionary theory. That firing was all the opportunity Marsh needed to bring him on full-time. Mudge's student and protege in the field, Samuel Wendell Williston, was also hired by Marsh. Together, they excavated the most complete dinosaur skeletons from the Jurassic in North America, in Canyon City, Colorado, before moving north and collecting more giant dinosaurs with Arthur Lakes in Morrison, Colorado, the type locality for the Morrison Formation. Williston went on to become the first dean of the KU School of Medicine and a prominent natural historian, not just of fossils, but also an authority on entomology. One of Williston's students is famous for finding the first dinosaur remains described as Tyrannosaurus rex. Barnum Brown, who grew up in Carbondale, Kansas, and collected his first dinosaur in 1895, was one of Williston's first students at KU. That specimen that Barnum Brown collected is the Triceratops skull that is on exhibit in Lawrence in Dyke Hall, the Natural History Museum on the KU campus. After this generation of great bone hunters, inspired and funded by Cope and Marsh retired, interest in paleontology waned, seemingly worldwide. The Great Depression, no doubt, put a damper on research funds. But before the Great Depression hit at the end of the 1920s, extravagant expeditions around the world were still being funded. The American Museum of Natural History in New York mounted a series of expeditions into Asia, though the primary goal of these expeditions was to discover the origins of humanity. What they found was a close second, in my opinion, evidence that dinosaurs laid bird-like eggs. Roy Chapman Andrews was the dashing figurehead of these expeditions, beginning in 1922, and is credited with this exciting discovery. He is also sometimes credited with being the inspiration for the Indiana Jones character in Raiders of the Lost Ark and its subsequent movie franchise. In actuality, that movie is basically a scene-by-scene -scene remake of Charlton Heston's Secret of the Incas, costumes and all. Interest in dinosaurs was greatly boosted by the revelation that their physiology and anatomy, at least of some dinosaurs, was more bird-like than lizard-like. John Ostrom's 1969 publication describing the vicious dromaeosaur Deinonychus is credited for reinvigorating this interest and inciting the dinosaur renaissance. 
If John Ostrom lit the fuse for the dinosaur renaissance, it was his student, Robert Bakker, who was the solid fuel rocket attached to that fuse. Bakker revolutionized the way scientists studied dinosaurs. He sought ways to measure the physiology of dinosaurs, to estimate the body chemistry and musculature the most accurate ways possible. Bakker literally had birds and lizards running on treadmills attached to respirators to study modern animals and compare them with fossil animals. Bringing modern medical technology into paleontology was the gateway to bringing all sorts of new modern technologies into the field, revolutionizing the science in a way that continues to have repercussions. I should not get started on the future, though, because this lecture might not ever end. Let me step back to the roots of dinosaur studies again, back to its origins in geology, studies of rocks that bear the direct fossil evidence, the remains and traces of dinosaurs. The first fossil hunters were armed only with the principles of geology. The vast majority of their knowledge can be traced back to a scientist named Nicholas Steno. Steno was a brilliant individual, a world authority on anatomy and geology. He was the first to scientifically conclude that fossils were the remains of ancient life, and that many can be likened directly to organisms alive today, using shark's teeth as an example. In 1669, Steno published what became the founding principles of stratigraphy. Superposition, original horizontality, lateral continuity and cross-cutting relationships, the concepts through which sedimentary rock layers are deposited. The idea that sediments land on top of one another with older sediments beneath more recent deposits that was first published by Steno. The idea that sedimentary layers are originally deposited in horizontal layers and might later tilt after being deposited, also Steno's idea. The idea that these layers can be contiguous with layers that are no longer connected and separated by erosion, and that the erosion that cuts through sedimentary layers has to happen after the layer had already been deposited. These, too, are attributed to Steno. It was more than a century before these ideas were further refined with additional principles of geology. These added principles come from the famous mapmaker William Smith. He produced the first geologic map of Great Britain, published in 1815, and introduced another principle of geology, that of faunal succession. His geologic map was inspired in part by the topographic maps that were created as a massive effort at the end of the 19th century. Topographic maps delineate how far above sea level an area is. Geologic maps delineate where different rock units outcrop. On modern geologic maps, you see geologic maps that also have topographic maps overlain, usually. Stratigraphy, the study of how sediments deposit themselves on one another, is important to paleontology because it is how we determine the relative ages of strata, and hence the relative ages of the fossils preserved in those strata. Combining the principles of geology, we can determine the relative ages of all the world's fossil outcrops. Where deposition was either not occurring, or sediments were eroded away, we are left with unconformities, gaps in the geologic record, or hiatuses. We can overcome these gaps by using faunal succession and lateral continuity, picking up the record elsewhere where it may have trailed off or been scoured away in one region. The ages we can determine based on these principles are not absolute ages measurable in numbers, they're just relative ages. So we can sequence the rock layers, but without other methods cannot determine the absolute age of the rock layers. This is where radiometric dating comes in. Radioactive isotopes decay over time, emitting particles as each radioactive atom changes on its way to becoming a stable atom. The speed at which radioactive isotopes decay is measurable and known value thanks to testing through a number of methods including mass spectrometry and electron spin resonance. We calculate and define radioactive decay rates in terms of half-lives. Each radioactive isotope has its own half-life, which is the amount of time it takes for any given sample to change half of its radioactive atoms through decay events. Carbon-14, for example, has a half-life of 5,730 years. That means that half of the carbon-14 in a sample containing carbon-14 will decay every 5,730 years. 
After a number of half-lives, the ratio of undecayed isotopes to those that have already decayed becomes too small to accurately measure. And this is why radioactive carbon is not useful for dating dinosaur remains, but instead was popularized through its use in archaeology. Paleontologists rely on isotopes that decay more slowly, like radioactive uranium, argon, and a number of other elements. These isotopes have half-lives measured in millions to billions of years. The discovery of radiometric dating comes from the hunt for a means to calculate the age of the Earth itself. Early calculations were made by Lord Kelvin by estimating the rate at which Earth had cooled since its initial formation. Physicist Ernest Rutherford, who compiled the first complete theory of radioactivity in nuclear physics, pioneered the use of radioactive decay as a means to ascertain the age of rock samples. His measurements of hundreds of millions of years from some samples were much greater than Lord Kelvin's own calculations for the age of the Earth, and as a young upstart in physics, Rutherford had to tread carefully proposing his hypothesis. With the estimated age of the Earth greatly expanded, the planet and its history could begin to be perceived in terms of deep time. The changes that could occur over such vast expanses of time were much greater than when people thought the planet was just thousands to millions of years old. Mountains could build and erode away, seas could form and disappear. The very shape of the earth could even begin to be seen as plastic, a changeable thing. This line of reasoning sparked inspiration in the mind of a talented German meteorologist named Alfred Wegener. He noticed that the shapes of earth's continents could be rearranged to fit together in a sort of enormous puzzle. All seven continents had margins that aligned and could theoretically at one time have been a single continent that split apart. His revolutionary idea was published in 1912, but was met with heavy skepticism, mainly because he had no source for the forces that would have been necessary to move continents. The liquid nature of Earth's molten core and mantle was not understood at the time. The continents were thought to rest on yet more solid rock. His hypothesis of continental drift did not seem complete enough for many and remained a sort of fringe idea for decades. Not until we understood more clearly what was happening at faults and continental plate boundaries did Wegner's idea make sense to everyone. Along these boundaries, deep beneath the sea, it was learned, new crust is formed and old crust is recycled. Divergent fault spread and magma rises to the surface, is quickly cooled, and continues to push the fault apart. Convergent faults smash into one another, driving one plate under another, forcing the plate underneath it to be subducted, remelted, and recycled into Earth's molten mantle. These forces act to move continents across Earth's surface. As recently as the Triassic, all of the continents were coalesced into a single supercontinent called Pangaea. Over the course of the Mesozoic, the continents broke apart and spread into a configuration approaching that which we know today. The rate at which the continents move is quite slow, on the order of millimeters per month. That's comparable to the rate that our fingernails and toenails grow. 